Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the October Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. Um, our, our, our topic for today is on drug shortages. Um, thank you for joining us. We wanted to let you know that uh, today's event is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. Um, the event video afterwards for, for people who can't make it will be posted on the Center for Bioethics and uh, uh, the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics and Law um, web pages. Um, you can submit any questions, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature. Um, and we will discuss those questions after the presentations in the uh, broader Q&A section of the, uh, of the discussion. Um, you can also um, continue the conversation on Twitter uh, using the hashtag, hashtag Harvard Bioethics, um, or the hashtag um, pol uh, Policy Ethics, which is the uh, hashtag that we've used in past months as well. Um, if you have a technical issue, use the chat feature, sending it to the, the message to all the panelists, and we'll try to help you with that. Um, and um, you are welcome to check out future events at the Bioethics uh, webpage or at the portal webpage as well. Um, oops. Let's see. So... Uh, um, so I want to welcome everybody. My name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine at, uh, at Brigham Women's Hospital, um, and I run the uh, portal research program at, um, at the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics. It's my uh, pleasure to be able to um, uh, to be able to host these events with my uh, co-teacher Leah Rand. Um, these uh, this series of uh, health policy and bioethics consortia run on the second Friday um, of every month. Um, and we are always excited by the high quality of experts um, that we have. And today uh, in talking about drug shortages um, and managing um, allocation in the supply chain, uh, we also have, again, two national experts on this topic to talk to us today. Um, the goal of the consortium, as always, is to articulate key issues in the healthcare system and public health that involve ethically challenging policies or practices. Um, bring together experts with different perspectives who work in different, um, you know, who work on the topic um, at, at different levels or at different areas or, or take uh, different approaches to the topic to come together and, and think about the issue and propose solutions um, and to stimulate conversation and further academic study of the topic uh, to help advance the field. Um, if you are interested in the, in the work that we do at the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics and Law, you can follow us on Twitter at, at portal underscore research or check out our website at portalresearch.org. If you were to do that, um, you would know that the last uh, week has been a particularly prolific week for uh, work coming out of Portal. Um, here you can see uh, a selection of the um, multiple uh, research papers uh, and commentaries that, that have come out of the group um, just in the last week. Um, studies of biosimilars, looking at uh, public funding of transformative drugs, um, comparisons of health technology assessment approaches. Um, all of these topics and more um, are the kind of stuff that we work on. And so if you're interested, please, please come by. Um, and then uh, as always, just want to give you a little bit of a uh, update of what's coming next in the, uh, in the consortium series. Um, in November, we're going to talk about uh, concussions and youth sports, how much is too much risk. Um, and then in December, discussing uh, experimental drugs, which has been a topic uh, that has been uh, in the news uh, over the last week or so um, uh, to a substantial degree. And we're going to talk about that in December with, uh, again, a couple uh, national experts on the topic. Um, but uh, so today, uh, to bring us to our, uh, to, to introduce us to our topic, I wanted to uh, turn the floor over to my uh, friend and colleague, Amit Sarpatwari, um, who is an assistant director of the, pro or the portal program. Um, he is a lawyer and epidemiologist and, uh, and does a lot of research on um, pharmaceutical policy issues, focusing on, on FDA, um, biosimilars and biologics, and uh, is here today to talk to us about uh, drug shortages, why this is an issue, and to introduce our, our two guest experts for the day. So Amit, um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Leah, for organizing this session. And I think we've got some great experts who I will soon introduce on this topic. But uh, as Aaron mentioned, I'm a lawyer and epidemiologist, and I work in the portal program. Um, and this is a topic that's definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, drug shortages uh, are definitely an increasing subject of national and international concern. And so when, when we're talking about, well, what do we mean by drug shortages? Uh, there are uh, two sort of primary definitions and they largely overlap, but there's a slight difference. And I think it's important to cover that. So what does the FDA define as a drug shortage? It defines as a period of time when the demand or projected demand for the drug within the United States exceeds the supply of the drug. Uh, and then you go to the Ashby definition, the American uh, Society of Health Systems Pharmacists, a supply issue that affects how pharmacy prepares or dispenses a product or, or influences patient care when prescribers must use an alternative agent. And so if you're looking at how these definitions overlap, usually the Ashby definition is a little bit larger. And so when you look at counts as to what FDA and Ashby say, how many drug shortages there are, usually the Ashby count will be a little bit higher. And when we take a look at the Ashby count, which is built on information from the University of Utah Drug Information Service data, which is led by Dr. Aaron Fox, one of our experts, you can see in this first figure on the left, um, the drug shortages, new drug shortages by year. And you see a sort of uptick from about 75 in 2006 to over 250 in 2011, and then a slight decrease. But out of those shortages, the majority are injectable products, and we'll discuss that in future presentations during this session. Um, but since 2007, you can argue that there's been a decrease of new shortages, uh, at least a trend uh, of a decrease in new shortages. But when we actually take a look at the number of active drug shortages by quarter, that's remained relatively stable. And so what it pretty much means is that uh, problems that have occurred, new problems, aren't always being solved. And so while uh, perhaps a smaller number of new problems are emerging, we're not doing all that we can to tackle existing problems. Um, and you know, when we're talking about what classes that these exist in, um, some of these older injectables commonly include anesthesia drugs, pain drugs, antibiotics, nutritional or electrolyte products, or chemotherapy agents. Now, COVID-19 has exacerbated the crisis. So we've seen a surge in use, uh, sort of things that we would predict. Uh, so shortages of drugs associated with ventilator use. Uh, you see this stat news article headline from April 2020. We see non-evidence-based use. I think the classic example is the run on hydroxychloroquine. And this is a uh, graph that you see from the CDC. Um, showing the uptick in prescribing uh, or dispensing of hydroxychloroquine uh, by non-routine prescribers of the drug uh, hitting right at April, uh, at March and April 2020. And the downstream consequence of that is the non-evidence-based use of hydroxychloroquine for which the uh, recent NEGEM study has hopefully put one of the final nails in the coffin for uh, its importance in COVID-19 has resulted in lupus patients uh, lacking uh, the ability to access a critical drug for their care. Um, and then we've also seen a lack of new drug manufacturing capacity, and uh, most relevantly in the context of remdesivir, again, a study came out yesterday showing uh, uh, that it does have a mortality benefit, but uh, over the summer, we've seen problems from Houston to Miami of hospitals running short of remdesivir for COVID-19 patients and such proposals, difficult decisions in terms of allocation of these products uh, uh, to a proposal that perhaps a fair way is through a lottery system. Um, so we've got difficult questions that are now arising uh, that have been there, but are uh, being put in even more of a spotlight in the context of COVID-19, and we're hoping to address some of those in this session today. 
So what is it really that we want to drill down in in today's session is, well, what has been the impact of these drug shortages? How grave and great of an effect have they, these shortages had on clinical care? Um, within that, how are scarce drug allocation decisions currently being made? And we know that there's variation in how they're currently being made, but what is the broad spectrum of the decision framework that's currently being used? And uh, how should those scarce drug allocation decisions be made? Um, we also want to understand the causes of this problem. So what factors are contributing to the drug shortage problem? Um, and what have we uh, done about them? So how have these factors changed over time? And then in terms of solutions, what corrective actions have been taken to address the drug shortage problem and what further steps are needed? And it's really a pleasure that we have two wonderful experts who are going to weigh in on these topics uh, and provide some insights that can hopefully advance the dialogue and show us where we're headed. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce these two experts. And the first is Dr. Yoram Nguru, a pediatric hematologist oncologist with joint faculty appointments at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics and the Herman and Walter Samuelson Children Hospital at Sinai Hospital, where he chairs the Sinai Hospital Ethics Committee. He's also an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, a primary focus of his scholarship has been the allocation of scarce life-saving medications. Dr. Unguru has served as an ethics consultant to national organizations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association, sits on the editorial board of Pediatric Ethiscope and leads a multidisciplinary transnational working group examining the ethical and policy implications of chemotherapy shortages in childhood cancer. And our second expert is Dr. Aaron Fox, who is the Senior Director of Drug Information and Support Services at the University of Utah Health, which provides content for the American Society of Health System Pharmacists Drug Shortage Research Center. A patient advocate, Dr. Fox has testified before Congress and published multiple peer review articles on possible changes to improve the ongoing drug shortage crisis. She has been honored for her work by the American Society of Health System Pharmacists and the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. So it's a pleasure to introduce both of these speakers and we'll start with Dr. Un Guru um, and I, I'm privileged to hand off the floor to him. Thank you, Amit. Uh, and just to uh, verify, you all can hear me, yes? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Okay. Um, that was a lovely introduction. I would have been satisfied with wannabe tennis player. Um, uh, hopefully, you guys can uh, see my screen. Uh, hope, can you see that as well? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Okay. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, I want to thank uh, Aaron, Amit, uh, Leah for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you all for zooming in. I hope you're well. Um, I've been involved with uh, drug shortages, in particular chemotherapy and supportive care uh, drug shortages for a number of years, both as a clinician and as a member of the Children's Oncology Group Steering Committee on Bioethics, not something I anticipated ever having to do. And so in the time that I have, I'm going to give you guys some background about the shortages and discuss the unique ethical issues they raise for clinicians and institutions. Then we're going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to come up with your own allocation schema for scarce life-saving chemo for kids with cancer. And in the Q&A, if there's time, I'm happy to tell you about an approach that a task force that I led has come up with. So... Disclosures. There's a group participation participation part in this. So um, hopefully you guys can recognize some of these people. And if you want to type in a Q&A or, or chime in, we've got Tanya Harding. Many of you are in Boston. Anybody, uh, Amit, do you know who this is? Aaron, do you know who this is? I don't, I don't remember her name, but is that the Rosie Ruiz? Oh, you are good, man. Yes, yeah. so Rosie Ruiz won say. the 1980 Boston Marathon by entering the race uh, a half a mile before the end. And <laughs> one of the things that gave her away was that was water that was on her shirt, not sweat, because she hadn't broken up a, a sweat. Um, here we got Rick Singer, the mastermind before the uh, behind the uh, college admission scandal. And most people know who these two folks are, you know, Felicity Huffman and Ann Pecky. So I'm a pediatric oncologist and bioethicist. I got no disclosures, people. I wish I did. Um, so drug shortages are not new. Uh, 
one of the first large scale drug shortages was insulin in the 1920s. And this was followed by penicillin in the 1940s that affected far greater number of patients. But over the past decade or so, these shortages have become increasingly more common, and this includes chemotherapeutics. And this is primarily a U.S. problem. Shortages do happen in other countries, but they don't happen like they happen here. In fact, I like to say that we own this problem. And I think Michael Link captured this most aptly. Michael is a pediatric oncologist at Stanford and past president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And you can see what Michael has to say here. Although we've had shortages before, they never lasted as long or involved as many drugs as they do. And if you look at the data that um, Aaron with AE, uh, my uh, co-panelist, uh, 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 publishes uh, uh, religiously every quarter, thankfully, uh, currently there's about 270 drugs in short supply in the U.S. So let me just repeat that for effect. 270 drugs in short supply in the U.S. And there's two main sources, as Ami told us in the beginning, you can get up-to-date info. The American Society of Health Systems Pharmacist and the FDA. But my focus today is going to be really, in my part, on the chemo and supportive care drugs. So when it comes to the chemotherapy, most of these affected drugs belong to this class of sterile generic injectables. But when you look at all drugs on the U.S. shortlist, not just chemo, up to three quarters belong to this class of sterile generic injectables. And it's important to appreciate that these injectables, they make up the backbone of proven and life-saving regimens, not just for kids with cancer, but adults as well. But because in pediatric oncology, we are so dependent on these injectables, when there's a shortage, we're especially hard hit. While the reasons for the shortage are multifactorial, most experts agree that the primary causes are economic, manufacturing quality, and to a lesser degree, regulatory. Following a two-year investigation, at the end of last year, the FDA published this report that you see here. And the FDA concluded what other experts had been recognizing for some time, that the primary drivers are economics. And they went on in the report to state this right here. Unless we're willing to make some change to our marketplace, we shouldn't expect these shortages to go anywhere. Now, Aaron Fox and I were fortunate enough at the end of 2018 to uh, testify at an FDA public meeting on the shortages. And uh, I was surprised to see this included in their report. Uh, during my comments, I, I tried to drive home the, the point that what we're seeing are shortages of decades old drugs, drugs that are reimbursed at dollars per dose that are life-saving and often for which we have no alternative. What we don't see are shortages of blockbuster drugs, drugs that are reimbursed six, seven figures, that maybe extend life for a few months. And it just doesn't seem to make much sense to me. And if you're still not convinced as to the economic drivers, maybe hearing from an insider, if you will, will help. So at that same meeting, uh, Martin Ventrest was there and Martin's a former VP and senior chief quality officer at Amgen. And now he heads up this outfit called Civica that Aaron's gonna talk about uh, in just a bit. And here's what he had to say, all drug shortages, all are the result of economics, financial and management decisions. But this isn't only a cost issue, lives are at stake. So let me give you some real data because we're only as good as the facts and the data. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Back in 2009, there was a shortage of an old tried and true chemotherapeutic called mechlorethamine, used to treat some young kids and young uh, adolescents with Hodgkin lymphoma. And at the time, evidence suggested that another chemotherapeutic, cyclophosphamide, was as effective. So 40 out of 181 of the kids got the alternative with the cyclophosphamide. Well, the two-year event-free survival for those kids who didn't get the standard of care, who got the alternative, was 12.5% lower. And while there was no death, these kids got exposed to considerably more rounds of toxic chemo, including stem cell transplant, the long-term effects of which still aren't entirely clear. And that prompted the authors of that study to state what you see here in the middle. Even promising substitute regimens should be examined carefully before adoption. What might appear to be a suitable alternative regimen may result in an inferior outcome. And for those of you who like to see that schematically, you can see that in this graph. And it's important to appreciate that it's shortages of chemo more than any other class of drug that affect patient safety. Suddenly we're using drugs we're not as familiar with in combination with others, and that results in a whole slew of problems. And this issue of safety is one of the downstream effects of the shortages that I don't think gets enough attention. So I just wanna take a second and walk you through what this really is about. So what you may not realize is that nearly 90% of the raw ingredients for the drugs we rely upon here in the US come from places like China and India. And over 25% of the drugs that are labeled as made in the US actually are made offshore in plants inspected by the FDA. And FDA is overwhelmed and understaffed. 
And so in 2015, FDA faced a dilemma. There was a shortage of a chemotherapeutic called doxorubicin. And we use that to treat plenty of kids, but even more adults with various cancers. And FDA had to make a decision. Do we allow these patients not to get the life-saving drug they need? Or do we allow to import the ingredients that we need to make that drug from the Chinese plant that they previously censured for poor quality? And what do you think they did? They did the latter. And you probably didn't hear about it. Further complicating matters is that drug companies aren't required to disclose to the public where they get their ingredients from. And if they're getting them from a, a manufacturer that has had poor quality. And then the companies are supposed to do the right thing. They're supposed to check the ingredients for purity, quality, and strength. Some do, some don't, uh, because it costs money. And so what ends up happening, as you've seen these important contributors here, including my colleague Aaron has said that the FDA ends up relying upon an honor system to make sure that the drugs we're getting are, are up to speed. Not sure that's really how we wanna move forward. Here's some more data from you, also from New England Journal. This is a, a paper published uh, that was a study of medical or adult oncologists asking them what the impact of the shortages were over a six month period. And a staggering 83% said that they weren't able to prescribe their preferred chemotherapeutic. Over three quarters said they had to make a major change in their treatment, such as picking a different drug or a different protocol. And over 40% said they had to delay the start of treatment because of a shortage. Imagine you're told, sorry, Mr. Smith, you have cancer, but I can't start treating you because I don't have a drug in stock. Now, what I find really concerning is even though these shortages have been around for over a decade, 70% of the respondents said that their hospital or group lacked guidance about how to ethically allocate these drugs. What about on the pediatric side? So here's a uh, study published in Pediatric Blood and Cancer. This was a survey of children's oncology group principal investigators and pharmacists asking what the impact of the shortages on clinical research and clinical care was over a two year period. And at the time of this survey, these were the drugs that were primarily in short supply. But take a look at this data. 50% of the COGPI said that at least one of their patients' participation in a trial was affected by the shortages, and over two-thirds said that at least one of their patients' clinical care was affected. This data from the pharmacist is damning. A third said that there was either a near-miss or actual medication error attributed to the shortages. And what you see on the far right over here is what they did to deal with the shortages. Now, I told you that 70% of the adult oncologists lack guidance. The exact opposite was true on the pediatric oncology side. 73% said there was center-level guidance. But I'd argue just because there's center-level guidance doesn't mean that it's necessary, ethical, or uniform. And then here's a national study just from last year. This was a survey of over 800 U.S. pharmacists asking them about the shortages. Without exception, 100% said they'd had shortages. Now, what I find concerning is that just over a third said that at their hospital, there was a drug shortage committee, a body tasked with deciding how to allocate them. And when there was a committee, fewer than 5% included an ethicist. To me, that's, that's somewhat uh, troubling. And I could go on, I could talk to you guys until you're blue in the face, until I'm blue in the face about the shortages and, and their consequences. They're, just, they're, they're very, very diverse. So this raises a host of ethical questions for us. What do we do? Do we delay treatment? Do we skip a dose? Do we give a lower dose? Do we prioritize? And if so, who gets to make that call? Me, the bedside treating physician, or maybe you guys, an independent panel? And if we do do that, what does it look like in practice? Well, let me give you an example. I talked to you about that methotrexate's a drug that's been in short supply before. We use it to treat kids with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the most common childhood cancer, counting for almost a quarter of all childhood cancers. We use it to treat kids with osteosarcoma, the most common bone tumor. So the average adolescent with osteosarcoma requires 20 grams of methotrexate for one cycle and 360 grams over the course of his or her treatment. That same 20 grams to treat one kid with osteosarcoma for one cycle could be used to treat anywhere from 1,300 to 2,000 kids with ALL for CNS prophylaxis. Does that mean that the kid with osteosarcoma's life is worth less than the kids with ALL? Maybe we prioritize kids over adults. Hey, I'm a pediatric oncologist, works for me. Well, that's what happened at Sloan Kettering a few years ago when they preferred to divert their limited Donna Rubison supply to kids over adults. What about first come, first serve? Seems to do away with some of those sticky ethical issues. Well, not so fast. Let me tell you about some of my concerns with first come, first serve. The first really is information. For better or worse, by virtue of you all being here today, you know about these shortages where someone who wasn't here doesn't. And I'm not sure we want to allocate based on that. 
The second is access. So let's say that there's one drug dose left and both Amit and I need it. And let's say that Amit cares about the environment and he rides his bike to the hospital. It's gonna take him a little longer than me because I drive like a good Israeli. I'm coming hard and I'm coming fast and I guarantee I'm gonna to get to the hospital before Amit. I'm not sure we wanna reward me because I drive like a maniac. But really the biggest problem with first come first serve is need. It doesn't account for need. We can have two patients with the same disease, but in very different places. So not the way you want to allocate. I've given you plenty of examples about how these shortages affect clinical care. We also need to remember how they influence our ability to conduct research. In pediatric oncology, we're very proud of the fact that each decade we've seen more and more kids with cancer survive. And that's because we do cooperative group clinical trials. These drugs that are in short supply, they're the backbones of our research protocols. How are we gonna to continue to make substantive observations in their absence? We saw that when even when we do have an alternative, like with the cyclophosphamide and methylorethamine, it may not pan out. Now this notion of co cooperation, coordination, this is one of the solutions to the shortages, not the focus of our talk, but happy to talk about it in the Q&A if it comes up. I would be remiss though if I didn't mention the gray market. So I'm sure some of you have heard of the gray market. For those who may not have, the gray market are a group of unauthorized secondary drug distributors who profit from the shortage. The average markup of a drug sold on the gray market is 650%. Now take a look at this data. This is years old data, but my pharmacy colleagues tell me it's still pretty relevant. What you see here are the top 10 highest marked up drugs sold on the gray market. And three of the top four are chemotherapeutics, a drug called cytarabine and dexamethasone, which you've heard about, I'm sure a lot this week, marked up over 4,000%, leucovorin over 3,000%. Remember, economics, business, management, financial. This is a screenshot of the Children's Oncology Group drug shortage page. The fact that we have to have a drug shortage page boggles my mind, but I wanna tell you, hopefully to drive home, how impactful these shortages are. Back in February of 2018, we had a shortage of a drug called Vincristin, and at the time there were two manufacturers. That same week, we had another shortage of a different chemotherapeutic called etoposide. The combination of vincristin and etoposide are used to treat about 95 to 98% of all types of childhood cancer within one week. Within about a year later, at the end of October last year, or beginning of October last year, we had another vincristin shortage. This one was really impactful because now we only had one manufacturer. And I think Aaron's gonna talk about this a little bit later. And the thing that really is bothersome is, as you can see, we have no substitute. This is not an antibiotic. It's not like I can swap out amoxicillin for penicillin. There's no substitute for vincristin. And then just earlier this year, yet again, we had another shortage of this drug called Irwinease. And I say yet again, because we have shortages of Irwinease every few years because there's only one manufacturer. And this was a paper that was just published a few months ago in Journal of Clinical Oncology talking about how important this drug is to children's survival. And you can see if they don't get it, they have an inferior disease-free survival. So again, we're talking about children's lives. Solving the drug shortage problem will require a major policy shift, one that's grounded in coordination and cooperation. But until that time comes, as a society, we need to be able to make the difficult decisions about how we want to divvy up scarce life-saving resources among equally deserving kids. Now, when I talk about prioritization, I think here in the US in particular, it's a four-letter word or the proverbial third rail. I say prioritization, and oftentimes the next thing I hear people say is allocation, rationing, and death panels. And here you see two opposing views. John Aris was a philosopher and bioethicist. Unfortunately, John passed away a few years ago. I'm sure some of you may be familiar with his work. And as you can see from these quotes, John talked about the importance that we be able to prioritize and ration. In the middle, you have Sarah Palin's now infamous Facebook post from 2009, where she talked about death panels. But what we need to remember is rationing happens every day in the US healthcare system. Insurance companies ration all the time when they approve or disapprove a treatment or a procedure. And in ethics, this is what we talk about as implicit rationing. Another form of implicit rationing is a patient's ability to pay. Explicit rationing is things like allocation of organs, hemodialysis, PPE, et cetera. All right, now hopefully you guys are gonna be able to participate. Otherwise, it's gonna be very quiet and Amit and I are gonna stare at each other. 
So I want each of you guys to imagine that you're a pediatric oncologist and you work at a busy center that provides both inpatient and outpatient chemo. And so far, you've been lucky. You've been able to have adequate drug despite the shortages. But when you come to clinic this morning, you're told by the end of the week, we're done. We have no more vincristin. And to make matters worse, the chemotherapy pharmacy director tells you that the usual avenues through which he's able to get additional drug aren't available because the primary suppliers halted production, resulting in a national shortage. Now, what you need to understand about Vincristin is it's kind of like our water. Chances are I'm writing an order for it before I even know what you have because we use Vincristin to treat kids with leukemias, lymphomas, bone tumors, brain tumors. So Vincristin shortage would have had a far reaching impact on countless kids with cancer. And that's exactly what you realize when you review your census of who needs it. Now, all of the kids are gonna be getting the same one and a half milligram per meter square dose of Vincristin. But because of their different body surface areas, which is used to calculate that, that dose, because of their different diseases or different protocols, some of the kids are going to get a higher dose, some a lower dose. Some are going to get a more frequent dose, some are going to get a less frequent dose. And to further complicate your decision-making calculus, some of the kids are getting Vincristin as part of a standard of care and others as part of a clinical trial. So my, fine, my question for you fine folks on this one o'clock afternoon on Friday is, how do you want to divvy up your scarce Vincristin? And you can think about yourselves much like this group. And as you're starting to think, I think we can all appreciate that the wrinkle or dilemma, if you will, of having to make the decision was appreciated in this paper published over 50 years ago. So, I mean, I'm not sure what the best way is, but I'd love to be able to hear what people say. Can they talk? Can they just put in the Q&A? What do you think? It would be great if, or, or you, it'd be great if you, do you want to pose specific sub questions from this larger topic? And sure. then we could perhaps take some votes if that's possible. I, I'm hopeful the administrator on here can facilitate that. If sure, you, and I, I apologize for throwing, talk about a wrinkle or dilemma. Uh, oh. <laughs> throwing this into the format. No, that's great. And I, I think if we can also, I, I have the participant list. If, if hands can go up, I can have people uh, uh, allow them to voice an opinion as well. But I, I guess it would be helpful to start with just, a, a, I guess, a more uh, narrow question to, to open the, the door to conversation. Absolutely. So I guess the first thing that I would say is, um, you first of all, you can say whatever you want. You can have an opinion about how you want to allocate who gets what, which kid, but you got to justify it, right? So you can't just say like my daughters do because, well, because, well, I don't know, just because. So let, let's drill down a little bit. Um, is there a particular uh, uh, type of patient um, disease-based, perhaps, that you would consider? Or would you consider allocating based upon uh, the child's uh, age? Or are there other specific factors unique to uh, the protocol, that, meaning the cocktail of drugs that the child is getting that you would want to consider? Maybe that's a starting point. So I see Jonathan Darrow has his hand up, and I'm going to allow him to talk. All right, am I waiting for my image to come up here? Or? Uh, I think we can just hear your voice. I think that'll be great if that's fine. I don't know if an image is going to come up. All right, well, thanks very much for your talk. I appreciate it. I was struck by the focus of the conversation, which seemed to, be, to me to be very much clinician oriented. We have this shortage. Oh my God, what do we do now? And uh, sorry to take this in a different direction, but I think this is the more important direction. I think that's the wrong question. Uh, it, that might be the right question if. Uh, like COVID, we've never had a shortage before and we never thought that we might have one. But as you pointed out at the beginning of the conversation, these are not only decades old, they're at least a century old. Uh, we know these shortages are coming. Uh, what should we do about it? And I guess the first question I would ask is what is the shelf life of some of these products? And is there a reason why the question isn't, dear hospital administrator, can we please have three more months of Vincristine in stock. Is that not possible because of the nature of the drug? Great question. And, and your, your, your observation is spot on. Um, and you're wrong before you, you keep on going. I'm going to say for other participants who want to weigh in on this specific question, please do raise your hands and we will be able to bring in your comments. And, uh, and also just a reminder that some of the clinical focus questions that have been brought up in this will be focusing on some of the more systemic 
and policy related questions in the second talk that Aaron will give. But sorry to interrupt you. No, no, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and and the, the clinical and the policy are intimately related, but I, I prefaced my remarks by saying I'm a clinician. And uh, we need to be able to help our clinical colleagues, as you noted, not just with COVID, but with these issues and uh, on the ground. They need concrete guidance. They need explicit recommendations. And uh, the, the, the idea here of shelf life is, is critical. I know that Erin's going to address that, so I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, uh, there, are, there are many options uh, that, that we oftentimes overlook. Um, but this does certainly require taking a step back and rather than being reactive, we have to be proactive. I think that's what we're seeing uh, when we're tying this into the current crisis with COVID, that rather than, than wait, uh, we're trying to get out in front of the, the moving target and come up with appropriate ethical, transparent allocation schema that have public buy-in. Uh, and so if you'll, if you'll allow, uh, we, I promise you we will get to your, your, your larger question, which is the right one, over the course of the uh, coming minutes here. But I would, I would be curious just to hear if there are folks who have an idea about, you've got two kids who are right in front of you and only have enough drug for one of them, how are you gonna make that call? Neeraj. Why don't you introduce yourself first and then uh, ask your question? Uh, hi, hi, my name is Neeraj Patel. I'm a uh, research assistant at Portal. Um, I think that the first uh, thing that sort of came to mind if I were faced with this sort of seemingly really difficult decision would be to try and, uh, this is a very, I guess, utilitarian approach, but to try and think about which of the two options would maximize the number of life here is saved. Um, and so I think part of that might be uh, trying to figure out a way to calculate expected benefit of receiving the drug uh, for each of the patients and then sort of subtracting that from the level of severity of disease in each of those patients to try and sort of balance those two factors to come up with uh, an answer. Although it, 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 I am kind of cringing while I'm saying that because it is uh, I think a little bit difficult to talk about in those sorts of terms. No, and I mean, before uh, you run, if you want to, Samson, is yours? Is your comment directly related to this? Because we could take that too, and then and then turn it back to you, Ram. Yeah, so it's somewhat related. Um, first of all, I'm I'm a medical student from Hong Kong, which is where there is a centralized drug formulary, and the way we tend to deal with this is we we calculate, like we do a cost utility analysis based on quality adjusted life years, and then we depending on, um, it's the same, which is we, we maximize the quality of adjusted life years to, to allocate these resources. So I don't know if that will work, but I don't know, I don't know the intricacies of the health, US healthcare system. So that might be why it doesn't work. Sorry. No, thanks for your insight and bringing that up. So both, both are great points. The, the, one, the one thing, I'll, I'll go backwards, I'll start with Samson. Uh, we don't have great pediatric data on qualities. Uh, that's a little bit more fleshed out, I think, in the adult world. Um, uh, but, but both of you raise important points about this, this threshold of curability and, and getting the most bang for your buck. Um, you know, the, the problem with qualities in a pediatric uh, uh, population in particular is if you've got a four-year-old and a 14-year-old, but you still have the ability to cure both of them and they're otherwise able to live a normal life expectancy, you're still looking at 60, 70 years for each one. And is that really where we want to make that decision? So the degrees of precision that is required are, are, are much, much higher. Uh, and, and it's a little bit harder to do, but absolutely, uh, we don't like to think about it because we are able to cure so many patients, but having some prognosis-based threshold probably makes sense. The, the concern here is though that kids who have more aggressive disease and who may need that drug, need that drug really. They don't have any other options. And so there are some other, you can flip it on, on, its, on its side actually. There are probably diseases that we use drugs that aren't as critical, but have just historically been part of protocols that you can withdraw and use those for kids who need them more. So an example here would be a kid with a rhabdomyosarcoma or a bone sarcoma who needs a drug like a doxorubus that I mentioned before, or as a kid with a Hodgkin lymphoma probably doesn't need that drug because they have other options in their armamentarium. Um, 
I, I, I want to certainly continue to move forward and allow Erin to do her talk. I don't know if there's if any, one other person maybe has a comment and then uh, maybe later we can continue if there's time. Or we can just Again, move if, forward immediately. If, if anyone has a comment that they'd like to make, please feel free to raise your hand now. Otherwise, we can address this in the Q&A, definitely. Uh, I'll give it another five seconds and then don't be bashful. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't, why don't we continue? Forward. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. So um, we've talked about COVID and I just want to uh, drive home what uh, Amit uh, noted uh, because I think uh, a shortage is a shortage. And this isn't just related to my particular world of pediatric oncology. So here we are at the end of February and there's this notice and then the next day in the Times there's a story. And I think one of the problems about the shortages that Aaron's going to uh, I, I think talk about is uh, the lack of transparency, the opaque nature. Uh, we, we can say there's a shortage but we can't tell you what the drug is or where it's made. And then you have Commissioner Hahn with this statement. Uh, you know, the next day, it's not just that we have a shortage, but we're starting to see price hikes. And in part, this is related to where are we getting the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Within a couple of weeks, it's the shortages of the paralytic sedatives and anesthetics. And then you have this story in the New York Times in early April where Sherry Fink is quoting a, uh, a critical care doc talking about uh, the medication shortages. And really down here on the bottom, then you see this statement by Senator Tina Smith, who's one of the uh, sponsors, co-sponsors of the MEDS Act and talking about, yes, we're worried about shortage of PPE, but it's really the drug shortages that are gonna uh, break our back. And so I'll leave you with this statement that came from that FDA report. It's not that shortages can harm pa patients and impose burdens. I would actually argue that they do. Uh, so thank you guys for your time. Uh, thank you for participating and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over, I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it over to uh, Aaron. We've got you on mute, Amit. I, I think you're... Great. So, Thanks very much, Aram. Aaron, the floor is all yours. If you have any issues loading your slides, just let, let me know. But um, looking forward to the next phase of the analysis of the problem. Okay. And slides are good? Yep, we can see them. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I want to echo um, uh, your arms. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much to the portal folks, uh, Aaron and, and Amit and, and Leah and everybody um, for, for this invitation and, and to get to talk about something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, super quick disclosure, um, you know, just uh, our university wants to make sure that uh, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and, and not the University of Utah. And then, uh, you know, I am an unpaid volunteer for, for Civica and um, we also do some work with Vizient, um, but no funds are paid to me. So I want to talk a little bit, you know, you aren't set up a great clinical dilemma, right? And, and it is uh, just um, heart wrenching to think of these decisions, but I want to take us back to think about how we got to this place where the United States has so many drug shortages. And one of the problems is that for injectables, especially for generic injectables, we've got a really fragile supply chain. And, and part of the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of concentration in the market. So usually a product maybe has one to three suppliers and you know, three suppliers sounds good, right? Like one, one person could take over for the other. Um, but you know, thinking about that Ben Christine example, um, one company had 97% of the market share uh, rather than um, you know, kind of an even split. And that's the usual case. One company usually dominates and that market share data is not publicly available. And so it's, it's not transparent who has the most. Um, we also have a very limited capacity. Many of these products are all made on the same manufacturing line. So you can have one line uh, with maybe 20 or 30 products rolling off of it. And it's, uh, you know, any, any kind of a glitch there doesn't affect just one product, it affects multiple. Um, there's also, you know, in the United States, we have no requirement for any company to make anything. We have this free market and no matter how life-saving the drug, doesn't matter. Nobody has to make that product. And, you know, when you think about this, about how drug manufacturing is a business, 
these decisions actually make sense. It makes sense to, to make your decisions based on profitability and how much would it cost to fix something. Um, is it more efficient to run your factory 24 seven or to expand and have some additional capacity? Uh, these things cost money. And, you know, unfortunately, most of the time we've got shortages because of a serious quality problem at the factory. And uh, that's, that's just the bottom line. Um, the economics are, are real. Um, you're not going to invest in your factory to make really cheap drugs. Um, this, this chart from FDA uh, notes that most of these products that are short are, are less than $9 a dose. Um, you know, the investments required to maintain your factory, uh, to maybe invest in redundancy, invest in a continuity plan, invest in a backup plan, it's just not built in with, with this pricing structure. So, you know, again, I, I really want to make sure that people understand that the reason we have shortages are quality issues. Now, certainly, you know, what is the root cause of that quality issue? Um, I, I fully believe it's an economic issue. Uh, these, these companies have not invested in their factories, and thus we have quality problems. And so, you know, quality problems are actually a really... Um, a really interesting hot topic uh, for, for probably the past couple of years. If you haven't uh, read it already, read Anna Edney's series in Bloomberg about America's love affair with cheap drugs and the hidden costs. And it is a bone chilling expose of drug companies blatantly flaunting the manufacturing rules, blatant uh, contamination, shredding documents ahead of time. Um, it actually even resulted in uh, Commissioner Gottlieb at the time uh, issuing a quick statement um, in, in response to, to this expose. If you also haven't read it, I, I get no, no royalties or, or fees uh, from, from recommending this, but uh, read Catherine Eben's uh, book. Uh, it, is, it reads like a thriller, and it's a quick read, um, and I think it should be mandatory reading for any healthcare provider. So, you know, when we talk about quality issues, even a really small quality hold can be devastating. This Vin Christine example uh, that, that we talked about earlier um, with one company having 97% of the market share. Well, what happened? Uh, Pfizer had a, a quality control issue that they needed to investigate, but because they had so much of the market share and they didn't have additional stock on hand, it's all just in time, um, you know, it really held up therapy. And they also didn't communicate well at all you know, uh, hospital pharmacists were hearing, you won't get your order, you know, until, you know, three months from now. It created a massive panic, massive um, allocation decisions that, that maybe didn't actually need to be made. Um, and, you know, the most frustrating part about this was these market shares didn't come out until probably three or four news stories in. Um, you know, the, Teva really got thrown under the bus uh, for discontinuing their product. But with a 3% market share, why wouldn't you discontinue that product, right? Does it even make sense to invest in, in making a, a difficult to make product um, when, when you only have, have a small amount of the market share? So uh, these small quality holds, um, when not communicated correctly and without a backup and redundancy plan are devastating. We also see problems with quality in our very common uh, blood pressure medications. Um, it, is, it has been very interesting to talk uh, with uh, congressional representatives about uh, their concerns with, with their own medicines uh, being contaminated, being recalled, having drug shortages. We are over two years into this thing with, with the ARBs and we still don't have a good list of, of everything that, that is affected. And you know, you can say, well, you know, a shortage is one thing, but the quality problems actually also can cause direct patient harm when the products are contaminated. And this, you know, Kaiser Health News story by Sydney Lepkin is absolutely worth your time to read. You can read about uh, Anderson Moreno and how his heart transplant was delayed because he had a Burkholderia infection from DocuSafe liquid. DocuSafe liquid is basically soap. It is uh, a useless product, um, but it is frequently, frequently used in, uh, in clinical settings as a stool softener. This is what 
part of the problem is with the lack of transparency that we have, this is what it looks like uh, when we're trying to remove contaminated products off of the pharmacy shelves. In this case, FDA didn't even have a complete list on August 8th in 2017 of all the products that were affected. In, affected by contamination with bacteria, I, I want to add. And so it took uh, almost a month to, to get that full list of all of the products that were, were contaminated with bacteria. Meanwhile, patients are being exposed. So I left the question earlier. You're thinking about the wrong problem. You're clinically focused, but how can we fix this? Um, I, I absolutely agree. We, we, the clinical problems are so important to solve on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have got to be thinking about how we fix this, this problem. So uh, at the FDA meeting that, that uh, you mentioned and that we were both at, um, the report uh, came up with kind of three main solution ideas. And you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good to work on. What I'm fascinated at is, you know, almost two years later, not much has happened um, on, on these at all. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about onshoring, right? Let's move everything back to the U.S., especially with, with all the COVID concerns. Folks are, are wanting to onshore everything. Will that fix shortages? I say no, not for drug shortages. And the reason I say that is because year after year, all of the data that we have for all of these injectable products that are affecting our, our clinicians every day, these are made at factories inside the United States inside the US, they're already onshore, right? They just have bad quality problems. So that's not gonna fix the problem. Uh, certainly there's a discussion about onshoring for raw materials. Um, if you want to prevent national security risks, yes, there is absolutely a role, role, role for that. But to, add, to say that onshoring will truly fix shortages, that, that is not the case. And when we look at these data from FDA, um, you know, how good are the US factories? Look at these. Um, these. These show um, the percent of manufacturing facilities that, that need to have some kind of action after an FDA inspection. And the US is not number one. Um, you know, we, we have some quality problems here in the US. There is a tremendous amount of attention right now on increasing transparency. And I'm so glad to see this because, um, you know, it's, it's really a, a situation of almost like online shopping but without any, you know, seller um, ratings, any information about who, even the company that makes the product, all of this is, is, is not available to the people that are purchasing medicines. And I want to spend a second to, to really uh, hammer in this, this transparency recommendation because Janet Woodcock and, and Marta Wasinska laid this out in 2013. So seven years ago, it was, the best argument and really lays out that the reason we have poor quality is because there is absolutely no incentive for manufacturers to have high quality. We have a pass-fail system in the United States. Now, FDA sees a fully graded system. FDA sees, you know, A plus to, to F. Um, but the problem is the passing grades, you know, a, a C minus factory, is, is going to be the same uh, pass-fail system as an A-plus factory. There is no incentive for any company to invest the money to give themselves an A-plus factory. Everyone is just going for that C-minus, barely passing grade. And because that's not transparent, people that purchase drugs have no way, absolutely no way, uh, to preferentially buy from, from a company that, that has an A-plus factory. I am in charge of, of all of the purchasing for our health system. Almost half a, mil, uh, half a billion dollars, of almost $500 million comes through me. I want those dollars to go to high quality medicines. I, I want to know, but unfortunately we have such opacity um, that it's, it's impossible. And, you know, Janet Woodcock came out uh, even last year talking about really, if we're going to fix shortages, we got to have manufacturers focused on quality. It's the only way forward. And so, you know, there are quality metrics goals, uh, things about, you know, really modernizing uh, quality oversight, um, 
and and I think you know some of the ideas that have been thrown out there are like a star rating scale for manufacturers. What things do you buy without looking at the ratings? You know, if you go to a restaurant, uh, if you're purchasing, you know, a, a new wireless router, you want to see what are those ratings, um, and and that is something that we absolutely don't have uh, in in the pharmaceutical world. I think uh, this quote is very telling. Again, this is from almost six years ago. Um, these are FDA folks uh, talking about to really eradicate the problem. And, and FDA really sees what, what the problems are. To eradicate the problem, we've got to have companies invested in improving their manufacturing and modernizing uh, their, their quality systems. Otherwise, uh, we will continue to be in this um, you know, hamster wheel of constant drug shortages. So I want to take a minute and, and when, when I was at the FDA public uh, meeting, um, there were kind of three buckets of, of wish lists of, of what people felt like would help uh, their group the most. So the FDA wanted more information about reasons. Um, believe it or not, until very, very recently, companies didn't even have to tell FDA why they were having a shortage. Um, FDA doesn't have a lot of information about how much product uh, a given company can make, uh, the types of contract manufacturing organizations that they're using. They also often don't know if their company is using uh, a different source of, of API if more than one is approved. Um, it was very interesting to hear from the manufacturers. Manufacturers said, you know what? If we're gonna keep making these cheap drugs, and we don't want to because you know we don't make any money on this and it's really expensive, but if we're gonna do it, we need to have a guaranteed volume and we need to have a long-term contract. The way that uh, products are purchased right now, both of those do, do not exist. So um, with group purchasing organization contracts or even you know individual term contracts, um, most of the time you, you don't have to buy from a specific manufacturer. You can, you know, you can switch tomorrow if, if something is five cents cheaper. And unfortunately, that is the mentality of a lot of pharmacy purchasers. Um, if they find a cheaper product, they buy that one. Everything's equal. Um, we don't have any quality, you know, everything's pass fail. So why not go for the, the cheaper product? Um, we also don't have long-term contracts. Most of these contracts are for a year and you know, when you think about investing a lot of uh, effort into your factory to make sure that you are doing a good job uh, for, for a long time, um, a one-year contract doesn't cut it. And then, you know, the, the people that are buying the drugs, they really wanted um, certainly a consistent supply. Um, it is one of the biggest wastes in healthcare that we have uh, is the, the huge amount of labor that goes into all of the workarounds that are required to, to deal with these shortages. And they also wanted information about the quality of specific products so they can make a better purchasing decision. The idea is, I want to buy from a company that has a good record. They're not going to be recalling their products, and they're probably going to be able to supply me. Um, but with the current system, we don't have that at all. And so those are, those are kind of the gaps that, that, that we really need to work on fixing. Um, uh, Dr. Unger, uh mentioned the MEDS Act. Um, that is, is potentially still in play, but uh, the CARES Act was passed, and we actually got quite a few shortage provisions in that CARES Act. Uh, not, folks, folks may not be aware of this. And so, um, you know, we, we got a variety of concessions. The big thing that's missing, though, is transparency. Nothing in here uh, around transparency. And so if we go back to our, our gap analysis, what did CARES get us? Well, FDA got, got quite a few things. Um, they got more information about reasons. Uh, they're gonna get more information about the raw materials, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, they're gonna get more information uh, from, from those contract manufacturers. And there is a concession in there uh, that manufacturers should have some kind of business continuity backup plan. Uh, so purchasers got a little bit. Um, manufacturers didn't get anything. So it's like, we're not fixing the problem, right? We're, we're not close yet. We're getting there. So what about new companies, new ways to think about things? Um, 
Civica RX is one model. There are other models out there. Um, Civica RX is a not-for-profit uh, company. Again, uh, I am an unpaid member of the advisory board, um, but their goal is to really improve supplies. And what is unique about this venture is that they're actually giving the manufacturers what they say they need to do a good job. So it's a long-term contract. So I have to tell Civica how much of a specific product I'm gonna buy for five years. And I am absolutely bound to purchase that product. Uh, even if the drug doesn't come to me, uh, I say I don't want it, I still have to pay. And so um, I've got skin in the game uh, to, to really do a good job of, of making a good estimate. And so the manufacturers get a long-term contract and the guaranteed volumes. So we're still in the experimental stage with, with this company though. Uh, there are over 20 products available. Um, will it work? Uh, we don't know. Um, hopefully it will be. Um, we've already seen one of their products uh, on back order and that's dexamethasone. Um, and one of the companies that, that is making this product for them uh, is, is having a quality hold. And so we will see. We will see if this truly, this, this model truly does, does shake out and, and fix things. So just a, a couple key points, and then I'm really excited for the discussion. Um, this is a really good time for action. There's a lot of interest. COVID has, has really elevated the problem of drug shortages. We've had these shortages forever. Almost every drug shortage that we've had as a result of COVID, the, the spike in demand for patients, all of those products were short before COVID hit, with the exception of propofol. Um, but, but all of the neuromuscular blockers, all of the pain medicines, everything was short, short already. And so COVID just really ex exacerbated that. The missing piece that we do not have in legislation, uh, it's not in the Meds Act either, um, is this need for transparency. And it's something we, we have to demand. We, there's nothing else that we buy that we have so little information about than, than our medicines. And, you know, of course, working together on, on all of these problems, hopefully we can mitigate the, the, the actual patient harm that, that is happening. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And uh, let's, let's discuss. Sounds great. So I see some hands. Um, please feel free to put more hands and feel free to also type questions in the Q&A if you'd like, um, but I'm gonna take my moderator's privilege first and ask two questions uh, to each of the speakers. And I, I guess uh, to Dr. Fox, this is incorporating a question that was on the chat, plus uh, one that I had or that was thinking about, but um, I think you've alluded to this, but do you think the FDA's recommended solutions for the shortage crisis get to the root of the issue, or is a solution like, California's recent decision to begin public manufacturing preferable, and we know that California is working with Civica uh, on, uh, on that. And I guess this builds into a larger question I have, and, and of course, you've already disclosed your role with Civica, but it, it, do you think, they, I mean, it's met with early success. You've noted that it's in the experimental phase. Um, but are there aspects of the business model that give you concern over the long-term vibrancy of the generic market? I guess, how have the for-profit generic manufacturers responded to the growth of Civica? Those, those are really good questions. Um, so I, I think FDA solutions are, are good because they really are trying to get at some of the economic issues, um, especially looking at contracting practices. Uh, that, that's where Civica can, you know, this, this issue of a lot, making a long-term contract um, is, is different. FDA also really recommends this, this quality rating, more transparency about the, the medicines that we're buying, this improving transparency to improve the quality. Um, that, that, is, that is a key recommendation, and, and unfortunately, it's just, it's, it's not being worked on. Um, Civica is being transparent. Um, I, I will... I, I'm very happy with that. They will tell you which contract manufacturer is going to make their product. Um, but these are contract manufacturing companies. You know, we, we have a fairly limited number of companies that can make injectables. And they almost every last one of them had some kind of a quality problem over the last 20 years. So it kind of depends if they're going to fix it or not. 
and and how much how much money they're they're going to invest. I think um, potential downsides uh, to this would be if um, a company um, preferentially made product for Civica and then shorted the rest of the market. Um, certainly, hospitals can. It's it's not a it's not a huge fee to be part of Civica, but not everyone wants wants to to do that and and invest in these five year five year contracts. So that that is certainly a concern. Um, and I I don't want to dominate the the discussion, but um, uh, it, it's it's gonna it's, we're we're gonna have to see if these companies can really uh, ante up the quality or not. And there's two follow-up questions here that relate to this, but I want to give Yoram, if you did, you want to weigh in at all on this question? There's more coming for you a little bit later, but uh, well, so. I, I saw the Q and A. I peeked, and um, uh, <laughs> I mean, Aaron answered that more comprehensively uh, than than I will. So I'm happy to to, to field the next one uh, if, if you'd like. Sounds great. So. I, I, I guess I'll come back to a few questions to you, Aaron, but I want to give Yoram a chance to answer a chemotherapy-related question that's come up. It's uh, from Josh Hyatt, especially in chemotherapy medications because of the cost and research implications in pediatric dosing. Is there any indication that the higher level of accountability and transparency of drug manufacturers' marketing practices required by open payments correlates to increased rates of drug shortages? That's a good question. Um, and the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of any data um, that points to that. Now that could partly be in fact because we don't have a clearinghouse, we don't have a central repository of information and disclosure uh, requirements being what they are not. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure that there is any data on that. That would that would be interesting to to know. Um, Aaron, are you aware of that? Yeah. Um, no, that, that's that's a great question. And to, to build off, a, I mean, a related question in, in the area is just, you talked about there being a lack, a surprising lack of ethics committees at the local hospitals to make these determinations of scarce drug allocation. Um, but in the case of COVID-19, at least certain states have established scarce resource allocation guidelines. Um, do you think those guidelines, first of all, do you think all states should do that? And do you think that those guidelines should be mandatory? Or is this something where you would afford the local institutions uh, a, a, an amount of discretion? Very, very thoughtful question. So I think, you know, in the absence of a national policy advisory statement, local jurisdictions are going to have to be able to step in uh, because we can't sit on our hands and just hope for the best because we're seeing this every day that that's not appropriate. Uh, as far as the mandatory nature of that, I think the, the honest answer is it depends. In other words, if there is appropriate stakeholder engagement, if these policies have been appropriately vetted, if they're transparent, one of the things that uh, we and many other uh, groups and individuals talked about is hospitals need to be willing to be more transparent and post information about shortages. So you come to Sinai Hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital, University of Utah, Dana-Farber, whatever it is, there should be somewhere in the public domain, these are the drugs that are in short supply because we have not been effective at our level enough in fomenting change. And I'm not kidding when I say hell hath no fury like an angry mama bear. We need to get patients, patient advocates involved. And one way to do that is let's arm them with the tools that they have. So it's a somewhat circular kind of way to get you to address your question about should they be mandatory? I think if it's appropriately representative and it has the, the necessary uh, transparency, uh, uh, nuanced approach, uh, that is explicit and that is public, I'd be more willing to step out and say, yeah, that should be mandatory. But if it doesn't, I think we need to take a step back. Uh, and I realize that there's all sorts of civil liberties issues uh, uh, and others at stake here. And I'm going to stay with you for uh, one and a half extended questions. One, you said as long as the proper stakeholders are at the table. Who, who are the proper stakeholders who need to be at the table, would you say, at a minimum? And then second was just a question that was posed in the, ch in the chat, which is, um, 
you know, you would pose the question to us about uh, how we would decide. And uh, an audience member was curious about how how you react in those decisions and what are the most important factors you consider and realizing that that's hard to summarize in a very short <laughs> space. But uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pose those two to you before Aaron, there's, there's plenty of more coming back to you in just a second. Sure. So uh, question number one was who should be at the table if I'm, if my memory uh, serves me right with my one cup of coffee so far today. Um, so, you know, the, the people who need to be at the table in my mind, should resemble in many ways what a, a typical ethics committee looks at. These should be folks from all walks of life. So you should have clinicians of all flavors. You should have policy folks. You need to have community representatives. I mean, I think that is key. People who have zero affiliation with uh, the hospital, the pharmaceutical company, uh, whatever. Uh, there, there really needs to be as broad as possible. And, and patients need to have a, a say in this more than anything. Uh, that's a little bit harder, I think, when you're talking about pediatrics, but, but my, my, this does not relate specifically to peds. This is more in general. So that could be, that could be a, a parent. Um, and, and this needs to be a committee that is meeting well in advance, that is coming up and then is sharing whatever process they're coming up with to get public buy-in. You know, as far as how do I make this decision, um, there's a lot of really good work out there that many different groups have put out. Um, one of the most well-known is Govan Prasad's Zeke Emanuel's 2009 Lancet paper. There's Phil Rossoff and his group down at Duke in 2012. Uh, the Canadians out in, Tor in Toronto have really good work. We've added to that. Um, and I think what all of these, all of these approaches uh, recommend is something that Samson brought up. Um, uh, I think it was Samson who, who noted there's there's a utilitarian approach. I mean, we have to focus on moving away from the personal patient clinician relationship to the greater public health one. That's what we're seeing now. How you do that, I think, is, is, in the, is, is where the critical role is. So things that we've recommended are focusing on a threshold of curability where appropriate, meaning you've got an 80% versus a 40%, perhaps you divert in that way. Focusing on how important that drug is to that particular disease. Looking at the data. In pediatric oncology, you know, we talk about clinical trials all the time, but we also were very keen to using drugs in a research setting. We shouldn't do that because we still haven't had data yet that's finalized, and we've seen where a drug can look promising and not. So unless it's a tried and true drug, we shouldn't be prioritizing research over standard of care. Cohorting patients, maybe thinking about lower dose, and then we need to really think outside the box. You know, maybe we, we extend use of a drug beyond its shelf life. That's not legal. That requires a really informed uh, and transparent discussion with the patient and the patient's family. But, you know, I've had many times I've taken a swig of the milk at 12.05 a.m. when it expired at 11.59, and I'm still here to tell about it. And, and I'm, not, I'm not joking. I mean, that, you know, nothing happens miraculously, uh, uh, you know, a day after the drug expires. So I, I don't want to, like Darren said, dominate, but those are just some of the ideas. Yeah, right, that, wonderful input. Thank you. And I, I'm going to move to uh, another question on larger drug manufacturing issues. It's what is the role of the federal government in assuring supply by directly entering ma the manufacturing space, uh, i.e. government run drug labs? And I'll, I'll couple this onto, so we've seen proposals by Elizabeth Warren to enter the manufacturing space. Now she, her proposal would say that that could be contracted out, but it could also be a government run uh, manufacturer. And I'm curious, Aaron, what you think, and then you're on, if you want to weigh in after, that's fine. But uh, is that is that a solution we, be, we, sh we should be looking towards, particularly in light of all of the quality issues that we've been seeing as being the primary driver of some of these shortages? Yeah, so that's, it is an interesting question um, because, of, of course, with the federal government right now, we have no requirement for any company to make anything. Uh, but um, I'm really hesitant about having federal drug manufacturing facilities, um, in part because of the way the federal government is funded um, and, and the long-term um, uh, needs of a manufacturing facility. You know, you can imagine we'd have shortages during shutdowns, you know, uh, as we have these, you know, chaotic budget cycles, um, would that agency have enough money to, to do the work that it needs? And it, it's going to need long-term funding. Um, you know, I think 
the federal government really could play a role in enhancing uh, drug manufacturing. If we had these quality ratings, you could imagine that CMS might only pay for products with, with a higher quality rating. There's your incentive right there. I mean, it, it is a bit of a stick uh, and a carrot, but um, that is one, one way uh, federal regulation could, could really help. I, I am nervous about um, setting up, up specific factories, not only just because of the, the length of time and, the, and, and just, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. And I guess this builds into your I don't know if you want to weigh in. Are you skeptical or? Yeah, well, I, 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 perhaps not surprisingly, I, I agree with Aaron. The one thing I will say is um, uh, the pharmaceutical company exists for a very important role and they deserve to be fairly reimbursed and appropriately reimbursed for the hard work and the drugs that they, they provide for, for, the, uh, for the world. Um, there has to be a happy medium um, and we haven't struck that. Uh, the other thing I will say is, you know, the federal government has stepped in to bail out Fannie and Freddie. They've stepped in to bail out the auto industry. Uh, there's many ways that could happen. I am not a, uh, a policy wonk, um, uh, but uh, I do feel that the government has to take a, uh, a more uh, uh, important role. You know, we, we have other public utilities. If we view these drugs as critical infrastructure, which the AMA has said, which ASHP has said, which many people have said, if we view these drugs, these essential medicines, as critical infrastructure, then there has to be an obligation on somebody's part, and this I think it would be the government, to somehow make sure that they're provided. And so if we view these as a public utility, much like water, much like electricity, and there's a nice marriage between uh, public and private, that's one model I think that we could potentially consider. Not claiming that it's you know the silver bullet by any stretch, but something to, to dwell on. And this follows up on, I, I think, Aaron, you spoke to this point a little bit in terms of CMS perhaps only buying from those manufacturers that have high quality ratings. But uh, this was a question that was posed, um, which was, you know, what regulatory structures are in place or could be in place to effectively incentivize companies to make these admittedly cheap drugs and to do so at high quality? Are there other ideas out there um, that are being floated around or that you think should be given more weight? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about why these products have been driven down in, in price so low, um, much, much lower than, than, you know, some of the generic counterparts in Europe. And, you know, part of that is the, the DRG reimbursement that hospitals have, um, you know, that really forces uh, inpatient settings to just look for the any tiny cost cutting measures, measures that can happen, we, we may need to kind of think, think about that. Um, think about uh, the, the, the way that we might need to pay more for these products uh, if we're going to ensure accessibility. And you know, that's a little bit that, that Civica model. Certainly um, I will be paying a little bit more for, for some products, but I have this five year plan knowing that I don't have to worry about, about that product. And so, um, it's it's complicated, but it, but I think I think it's it's worth thinking about the reimbursement structure for sure. And Ram, do you have anything to add to that? Or I mean, I... that's what happens in yeah. other countries. There, yeah. There's the ability to negotiate directly with uh, drug companies, something that uh, oftentimes is not allowed and does not happen here in the U.S. And it's more of a level playing field. Uh, you, you do pay more for a vincristin, you do pay more for a dexamethasone uh, than what is paid here, but you pay a heck of a lot less for a, uh, you know, emesuzumab or these sexy designer drugs and things like that. And so it does allow for some more parity. So absolutely, I think that the, uh, the, the reimbursement, the average sales price plus 6% old model that was uh, passed is something that needs to be looked at. Thanks. And for the, all, the, all the wonderful questions coming in, thanks for your patience. I'm trying to sort of find natural ways to group them together. And uh, here's one more that I'll pose again for both of you. But um, uh, one is just this general question, comparative to the world stage. So is the drug shortage issue in the US unique or do other countries have similar shortages? Um, and that relates to another question that was posed, which is, is there a model country that you guys know of or that you guys hold up that has been particularly effective in recent years at mitigating and managing the effects of shortages when they occur? 
So I can start with Aaron if you want. Uh, <laughs> difficult questions, but great questions. That's a, it's, it's a really interesting question. I had the opportunity last year to go to Belgium. Um, there was a, a conference of with, with Europe and with South America and um, uh, all of these different countries talking about the way that they handle shortages. One of the things that I was struck by is um, the companies that do this negotiation and you know uh, really prefer maybe one single product, they are much more likely to have a shortage where they are completely out of, of something. That's actually pretty rare in the US. So it's usually we can't get enough of something or the right formulation. Um, but, but these countries are much more likely to um, have, uh, you know, just, just be completely out um, and have very difficult uh, time accessing another alternative because of that negotiation. Um, that, that was a surprise to me. The other thing um, that I will say that I learned, I'm not sure if it's a model that could be implemented in the US, but in Belgium, there is one central shortage committee. Uh, they have one EMR and they make the decision. It floats out and, and that's how they, they handle things. Um, clearly, that is far from reality for the US. And did you want to add anything, Yaron? Um, the, the only thing I would say uh, to add to that really is, is an aside. Um, I think we need, to, we need to go upstream a little bit and first decide on what is truly essential and critical that will then help us alleviate some of these shortages. In other words, let's come up with an absolutely must. And again, this is what Civic is trying to do and others, but I don't think we have agreement on that. And we, we, use, we use lots of different drugs, not necessarily based on data. Let's go back and, and make sure that we're, we're looking at the evidence. So, and I will say that the National Academies of Science has a, a new committee that will be focused on um, kind of looking at that, what is the essential list uh, a, a little bit later on, on this year. Great. Now I want to come back to something uh, Jonathan had mentioned before earlier. Jonathan, do you want to follow up on your question from before? Sure. Um, so uh, thanks again for some excellent presentations and for all of your expertise that you're sharing with us. I just wanted to re-ask my question from earlier, uh, which is uh, why can we not go uh, to the hospital administrators and say, please have an extra three months or whatever the median period is for drug shortages uh, of drug X. Is there something special about vincristine and other uh, drugs that have been in shortage that we cannot do that? I'm happy to, to jump in there um, and, and try to answer, uh, Jonathan. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems with the way these drugs are made, and particularly sterile generic injectables, is uh, what, what they call just-in-time production. Um, the, the companies don't, aren't able to, it's, it's hard to run these, these production lines. They don't have enough drug on the shelf. It's not like you can go to Amazon and they have, you know, a thousand copies of bottle of lies. Um, uh, you know, they keep just enough for, for a week or two. And, and, um, uh, I'm not a, um, I'm not a, a pharmacist or a, uh, or a chemist to speak to uh, what, the, uh, what the scientific rationale for that is, but from a business perspective, it's very hard for them to commit to keeping more. Um, I think by increasing the number of producers, which would obviously be uh, low hanging fruit it seems, but it's not because of the, the economic considerations, because of the difficulty maintaining these quality uh, lines that makes it even harder, and so you have one or two companies that is unable uh, and, and or unwilling to make them. And so I don't think this is a question for our hospital administrators. I think it's farther up the the food chain where the problem starts. And I think the other thing to think about is um, the the average length of time of a shortage is about a year, and so. Um, there are storage capacity uh, issues. Um, hospitals don't have a finite, uh, let's say that you decided to go with the WHO essential medicines list, uh, 200 things, uh, keep a year supply of, of all of that on hand. Um, it, it's, it would be very, very difficult to, to actually do that. Um, I think the, the other thing to think about, um, even with the Civica model, they have six months uh, extra kind of buffer stock on hand. But what happens if, if, if something uh, lasts longer than, than a shortage of six months? And so, so that's the other thing to think about. And then 
injectables in general, the, uh, the companies don't have a lot of incentive to have these products uh, to, to do the research to, to give them longer expiration dates. They will uh, during a shortage and FDA will extend those, those expiration dates, but um, most of these products expire in about two years. And so now I want to transition over to uh, reputational, uh, uh, the reputation of pharmaceutical companies and also their own allocation uh, decisions. So there's two questions here. Um, so I guess I'll start with the allocation one, which is that, could you speak to the allocation mechanisms that drug companies themselves have used during shortages. From my anecdotal experiences, it seems to range from no allocation mechanism to hospitals needing to submit individual requests for drugs. Um, and then the follow-up is uh, perhaps a larger question uh, is, I'm interested in the proposition that pharmaceutical manufacturers attend to the reputational implications of their decisions, RE, quality, or occurrence of shortages. Is there evidence of this? How does reputation or reputational loss impact or matter for manufacturers? So I, I, I can just jump in there very, very briefly. I mean, as far as reputation, you know, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act that President Obama passed in 2012, one of the requirements was that if a, that a pharmaceutical company notify the government about, hey, we're going to have a shortage and um, we're giving you a heads up. And, and one of the steps that uh, uh, existed was if they failed to do that, there would be a public letter essentially shaming. Um, and that did nothing. Like Aaron, like you showed in the beginning, like Aaron talked about, we've got these shortages uh, and nothing's changed. So I'm not, I'm not so sure um, that, <laughs> that that's the, the, where we want to uh, put all of our eggs in, in that one basket. Um, as, as far as uh, allocation and what the internal company, do, the companies do internally, um, you know, some are, are very forward thinking. Um, Jazz, for example, the company that, the one company that makes Arwinias, this really important drug for kids with leukemia and certain types of lymphoma, they actually convened a, a group of, uh, of, of folks to try to figure out a way that would uh, help them allocate their limited supply. Unfortunately, not much came of that. Um, others don't. Um, and so it would be really important to know that companies have a mechanism in place and again, that they're transparent. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a perfect policy. But uh, many wait too long, and and then kind of get surprised when there's a huge backlash. And uh, I think if anything, we're seeing now that's not the way that we want to deal with these shortages. Yeah, and I, you know those are those are great points. I think um, it's important to realize FDA also has zero input into how things are allocated. They can recommend, but drug companies don't don't for for instance have to ship product only to children's oncology centers, for, for example. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the other thing um, uh, to think about is, is the role of the wholesalers. So um, there are three large wholesalers, and they all allocate product very, very differently. And um, many drug companies actually don't have the capacity to directly ship. Uh, they work through the wholesalers. And so there, there's another layer there that, that, that often um, gets gets missed. With regard to reputation, unfortunately, these companies don't get a bad reputation for having shortages. Um, their bottom line is not affected because they're so cheap, so the stockholders don't care. And unfortunately, many hospitals are reluctant to speak out about shortages. No hospital really wants to be out there saying, hey, we're out of this, you know. Um, and so it's very underground. And so um, FDA gets a tremendous amount of blame. Um, you know, the pharmacy administrator gets gets blamed for for not ordering enough, but um, nobody blames the company that for six years chose not to fix the quality problems and, and now has to close down. Thank you both. And I know we're at time and I know some people have to leave. Um, I, I, this question is more towards Aaron on the line. Can we go for five more minutes on Q&A or should we cut it? Uh, I do think we have to cut it just because of other people's schedules, but okay. uh, if there's a yes, no question you wanted to ask, we can do that. No, I think that that's fine. So apologies to the people who have uh, posed some other very nice questions. Uh, unfortunately for time, we have to cut things to a close, but I do want to give in the, in, the, in the minute or two that we have last, uh, both Aaron and Yoram a chance to uh, say any closing thoughts on the issue. So I'll start with Aaron, if you, if, if there are. 
Um, yeah, just thank you so much. And um, this is a really important topic. Um, please, please keep talking about it. Um, make, make sure that the people are, are hearing of, about the drug shortage problem. A lot of it gets uh, swept uh, kind of underneath the, the rug and it's not, not widely talked about. It's important. And, and I would just also echo the thank you for covering this, uh, this issue. Um, I oftentimes feel like uh, I call myself a drug shortage prostitute. I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, uh, who's interested in this, but um, this is a really important uh, platform that you all have. Um, and, and get out there and, and let your, parent, your patients know. Let your community know. Um, it's shocking how many physicians don't know about drug shortages. Um, our pharmacy colleagues know and they keep us honest, but um, I did a, 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 an informal a poll in my hospital and it was shocking that, that doctors and nurses didn't even know about drug shortages. So clearly there needs to be more pounding of the pavement. Thank you both again sharing for sharing your expertise. I think this was a wonderful session. I think we learned an incredible deal. We will keep these ideas going and I hope you guys continue your work in this space and um, we're looking forward to some solutions and we know that they're not going to be easy. Um, but to the audience in particular, thanks for wonderful questions as well. Um, again, a very engaging um, session and uh, we look forward to the next one next month, but I'll hand off to Aaron now through the final goodbyes. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> there you go. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good afternoon.